Good morning. I'm Taylor Kambuzia, a mining analyst at Red Cloud Securities. We'd like to extend our thanks to Asenko for sponsoring this session. Our next presenter is Sarah Armstrong Montoya, who's the president and CEO of Cordoba Minerals Corp. Cordoba Minerals is advancing its 100% owned San Matias Copper Gold Silver project in Colombia, which includes the Alacran deposit, and it also owns a 25% interest with the right to earn up to 80% interest in the Perseverance project in Arizona. Sarah, you'll have about 15 minutes for the presentation and then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. Please take it away. Thank you, Taylor. So Cordoba is a copper gold developer with district scale exploration potential. We are listed on both the TSXV uh, and the OTC. We have two main projects. We have the Perseverance project, which is an early stage uh, copper exploration project in, uh, in Arizona, in the United States. It's part of quite a large land package. It's 13,000 uh, acres. And as Taylor mentioned, uh, it is part of a joint venture in earning. We currently have 25%. Um, we will very uh, imminently pass the 51% threshold, which I'll get to a little bit later. And we do have the right up to 80% interest in that project. Our second project is the San Matias project. That's here in Colombia. Uh, it's copper, gold, and silver. So we have about 70% copper, uh, about 27% gold, and about a 3% silver credit there. Uh, and we just announced our pre-feasibility study results on that in January of this year. Um, they were very positive that we, we announced an after-tax 415 million uh, US dollar MPV uh, with a discount of 8%. And I'll get into more detail in that in a, in a, in a little while. We have two major shareholders. So we are part of the Ivanhoe group. That's uh, Robert Friedland. So our majority shareholder is Ivanhoe Electric with 63%. And then we have our um, Chinese strategic partners, JCHX, uh, with a 19.9% uh, interest. So you can see over here on the right-hand side, um, our, our, um, the, the chart with our, our shareholding. I guess just a little bit of, a little bit of background on that. Um, we, Ivanhoe Electric have been a, a big supporter of the project um, and their predecessor, HBX. It wasn't the intention to get such a, a, a large shareholding, uh, they continued to backstop our financing when the when the market didn't didn't respond, and they ended up with with uh, quite a large position there. But we've been very fortunate, as you can imagine, having having uh, Robert Friedland as a backer there. Um, you can also see that uh, we have very little liquidity. We probably only have ten to twenty thousand shares trading per day, which has an impact on our market cap. So today we're at around sixty four million Canadian dollars. So there's really no consideration in that um, for the PFS results that we that we announced in January of this year. Next run. Um, so Mark Gibson, who's just joined our chief operating officer, uh, he and I have both been with um, with the group for over 10 years in various positions in various companies. Um, Mark was the founding CEO of uh, High Power Exploration Inc., the, the predecessor to our, our largest shareholder, the former largest shareholder, and he's concurrently serving as the, the COO for Ivanhoe Electric, Kaizen Discovery, and also um, Cordoba. Um, I resigned from my other positions last year and have been just now solely focused on, on Cordoba and was appointed as, as CEO in April of 2021. And you'll see down the bottom there, we also have Charles Forster, Vice President of Exploration. He's been with the group for many years and was one of the founding uh, geologists on, uh, on OT. Um, down to the page seven, please, Ren. Over to you, Mark. Great, thanks, um, Sarah. So you're looking at the ore body. This hill that you can see is where the ore body outcrops. Um, you will note that there is a small community living at the base of the hill, and um, Sarah will be touching later on the, the plans for having them moved. Uh, we've defined a reserve just over 100 million tonnes. It grows at about 0.65 copper equivalent, um, and that's given us pretty robust results. So it's a 13-year life of mine uh, with after-tax MPV of 415 million US dollars using consensus pricing of $3.60 for copper, $16.50 for gold, and an 8% discount rate. Uh, it also gave a 2.2-year payback and a 25% indicated rate of return. One of the reasons that we did this PFS was to define um, the engineering standards required for something called a PTO. This is a Colombian mining license application, and it's one of the two licenses that you need to build and operate a mine in Colombia. We had a deadline to submit ours on November the 17th of last year, and we have successfully done that with these PFS results. The second license that we now need is that of an EIA. Uh, so work is now continuing to do the baseline assessments for that, and we're now putting out tenders for the, the technical engineering work that's going to be required for that as well. Next round. 
So if you look at the map on the top right hand corner there, you will see that there are two mines to the north of us. Uh, we have a coal mine about 15 kilometers directly north and we also have Cerro Matoso to the northeast. So if you stand at the top of that hill I showed you previously, you would be able to see those two mines. And importantly, that means that the government in this region knows what open pit mining looks like, they're supportive of it, and the people know uh, what sort of benefits it can bring and the impact that it has. For us, we also see the services that we need for operating and building a mine in this area are on our doorstep, which is great. Next round. So we had some pretty robust results. This touches on the, the big items here. So um, we'd be looking at spending $435 million of upfront capital, $88 million of sustaining capital, and $68 million of uh, closure capital. Um, you can see that there's a, a, a bit of price sensitivity. Uh, we have two thirds copper and one third gold. And with the current pricing, we'd be looking at an extremely robust um, uh, project over $700 million MPV. But more importantly, we're also stress testing on the downside. So we can see that the project still makes money at lower prices, such as $3.24 there. Next round. We did in 2019 PEA, and there are some important differences between the, the PFS that we've just released and that PEA. Um, so in 2019, we used all four deposits in the San Mateus project, whereas for the current study, we've only used the Alacran deposit. And the reason for that is simply that the last two years of study, of course, have been COVID affected. We really only had full access to Colombia and in, even internally in Colombia, we had limited access for a very, very long time. So we really only had about nine months to do this, uh, this work and had to focus only on the mission critical things for that PTO. Secondly, we've um, ramped up from 16,000 tonnes per day to a current 22,000 tonne per day plan. And the reason that we did 16,000 tonnes per day in, at the PEA was that we wanted to minimise upfront capital. The markets weren't giving much um, capital, so we wanted to minimise that. We used a lot of expansion capital to get there. Of course, that's changed. Uh, we're seeing a lot of support for copper projects, and so we believe we can go bigger and quicker now. Uh, we've done a lot of work on tailings. So originally we were using conventional tailings in an adjacent valley in 2019, and we now have tested uh, thickened tailings. Um, we believe that we can co-mingle the waste rock dump with those thickened tailings to eliminate both, essentially. And um, thickened tailings as a paste technology is extremely stable. It doesn't collapse, it doesn't flow, it doesn't liquefy. So that's a more safe solution for the communities and the environment in this area as well. For us, also, of course, it has a compact footprint. Uh, so it's a much smaller mine design than previously, and that has a efficiency gains. We've also done a lot of metallurgy, um, so we're now very confident in the fresh rock recovery. Um, and we've also understand the behavior of saprolite. So uh, that's got benefits for, for gold recovery, which can be recovered from that early saprolite material. Lastly, we've done a lot of geotechnical studies, and um, those have preserved the strip ratio of 1.1 to 1 that we saw between the PEA and the PFS. Uh, we're still going to be doing a lot more work though, or there are still some upside uh, opportunities for us to chase. So we'll be doing resource drilling to bring ourselves up to a proven reserve. And we believe we can get a, a few more tons, a little bit more grade during that process. We're also going to be doing some of the trade-off studies that we simply did not have, have time to do in the truncated PFS. Um, but you can see at the bottom right there that we've still got these extremely high grade gold veins that uh, we occasionally intersect. So um, unfortunately, these are almost random in terms of their distribution, their grade and their orientation. So we've had to exclude them from this resource. However, um, they are still there. They are still an opportunity to add into, um, into the endowment a bit later on. Next, please, Ryan. We are still exploring locally, um, so we're doing a drill campaign right now to the north of the Alacran pit. Uh, this is to test whether the Alacran stratigraphy continues and whether it's mineralized. But perhaps the bigger question for exploration are these buried porphyry clasts that we keep on intersecting. We've put out a couple of news releases about these. Um, so we have in these breccias uh, mineralized porphyry clasts, which we've intersected in several holes now, and the source of those clasts remains undiscovered. Uh, but it would be logical to assume that the buried porphyry is local, um, and that has provided the fluids that have mineralized the Alacran stratigraphy to form that deposit. So finding that porphyry remains a, a real uh, objective of ours. Sarah, you're muted. Thanks. So uh, we have 12 communities within the within the area of interest. Three of those communities will need to be uh, will need to be relocated. Um, two of those communities are governed by the terms and conditions of the environmental impact assessment study. So the process is relatively straightforward. Whilst um, social work is always somewhat somewhat complex, it's, it, it is a relatively straightforward process. Um, those houses that you saw at the bottom of the hill that Mark mentioned before, they are of the Alacran community, um, and they are they're illegal miners. So whilst 
they're more the responsibility of the, the Colombian government. Um, we've recognized that, that it's in our best interest to include them in, in, in the process as well. Um, otherwise, they're probably going to be there when we come time to, to build the mine. So um, we have, um, we're in the, in the midst of finalizing a, a team to be on the ground who have successfully relocated uh, communities for four companies previously in, in Colombia. We're also working with a company to ensure that we comply with international standards as well as, as well as Colombian standards for ESG. And we anticipate reaching agreements with these communities uh, over the next 12 months, but the implementation of those agreements, so the relocation and resettlement of these communities um, would be subject to the, the licensing of the project. So once we get that second license um, and, and are able to build and operate the mine, which is the, the environmental impact assessment study. Um, over to you on Perseverance, Mark. Yeah, so this is the second exploration project that Cordova has in its, its portfolio. It's a United States-based uh, project in Arizona, a, a decent-sized property of 13,000 acres, which we're exploring in collaboration with Bell Copper. Uh, next slide, please, Ryan. Um, so the earning terms with Bell are fairly generous for us. So we've got the opportunity to spend $17 million over a seven and a half year period to achieve an 80% earning. We are about to cross the 51% threshold that you can see at phase two at the bottom there uh, with the drilling that we're currently sponsoring. We're in a great part of Arizona. We've got uh, Freeport's um, um, Baghdad and also Origin Mining's Mineral Park miners near neighbors. But the geological analog that we're working on here is the, the resolution project under Rio Tinto. So we're fairly close to the town of Kingman uh, on the left-hand side of the, of the map there. Um, this is an area that's been largely unexplored for uh, about the last 30 years. And the simple reason is pretty hard exploration. If you go there, you'll find that you're in a valley. Uh, you've got mountains with good exposure on either side, but the target we're looking for is actually underneath the gravels that have filled up that valley. That means that you need new exploration technology, geophysical technology to find these targets, which is an opportunity for us because the parent company, Ivanhoe Electric, has got those technologies and has brought them to bear on the system. Um, so the map here shows the, the geological theory. Uh, the left-hand side at the bottom there, you can see the root of a porphyry system. It's at the top of a mountain. So most people who go there assume that it's been eroded away. Uh, however, Dr. Tim Marsh, who's the CEO of Bell Copper, he recognized that you have basin and range faulting in this area, and that could have just as easily have taken that porphyry, carried it into the basin, and then subsequently it's been covered by gravels over the subsequent years. Um, so we drilled K20 a couple of years ago, and that produced some really good results. We saw some charcoal pyrite veining, a lot of hydrothermal activity, magnetite, um, uh, potassium alteration, uh, and long intervals of, of upgraded copper. So all of those things told us that the fluids associated with the porphyry have flown through this rock mass. And so the question is much more about where that might be than if it's there in the first place. So on that basis, we've done some immunity to lyrics. Uh, we re released these results last year, uh, and we're currently drill testing the, the anomaly that's on the top left-hand side there with uh, the K21, the first hole into that system. And then later on, we'll be dealing with the right-hand image. But the, the, the right-hand image also shows that this is deep blind exploration. You're drilling through three to 400 meters of gravel just to get to the basement, and then you've got a further 600 meters. So these holes will be, uh, will be expensive, uh, but with great opportunities that come from that, Sarah. Great, thanks, Mark. So um, what's on for us right now, we're currently defining the scope of work and, and, and we're putting out tenders for bid for the feasibility study and the EIA. The feasibility study will support um, the EIA, which as we mentioned is our second permit we require here in Colombia. Um, the requirements of the EIA go somewhat over and above the feasibility study uh, level um, engineering design. At some point, they're actually up to a full construction level. So we anticipate that taking sort of 12 up to, to 18 months, which would be followed by an investment decision and, and uh, detailed engineering. So mine construction could start anywhere between the end of 2023 and, and um, early 2024. Um, and we would be in production somewhere in 2026. Um, so as you can see, this is a this is a, an economical project. It's it's doable, um, and and we could be in production here in about four and a half years. And as Mark said, uh, on perseverance, we are imminently about to cross that 51% threshold and should have an announcement out um, in the near future. Um, for the current drilling program that we're doing on both of our drilling programs for Alacran and uh, and Perseverance, we would anticipate having something to the market probably after Easter, given the uh, the assays and the, the the backlog with um with the laboratories. Um, thank you, Taylor. Back to you. 
Perfect. Uh, thank you for the great presentation, Sarah and Mark. Uh, so just a reminder to everybody that you can submit your questions using the Q&A button on the platform. Uh, with that, we do have a couple here. Um, so first question, uh, Bell Copper uh, has recently had some, some positive results from their drilling at their, their big Sandy project. Uh, they're, they're going through some copper sulfide mineralization as they're drilling. Um, you know, the, the stock has re-rated kind of on that news. Uh, does that give you confidence in that concealed porphyry uh, target model? Absolutely, but I'll let Marcus, the geologist, <laughs> go into more depth on this one. Yeah, absolutely, Taylor. It's it's a strong affirmation of the overall model. Um, big big Sandy is to the south of, of us, but the geological concept is is similar. Um, and so we're looking forward to seeing the assay results, but it's fantastic to see uh, Tim's success at that prospect. And um, yeah, obviously we're, we're looking to see what our own drills come, come out with in the near future. Great. Um, okay, we have a question here. Um, is the company planning on growing the team either in Canada or Colombia within the executive or geological teams? Absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a requirement for us in taking this, in this project um, forward. And we've been growing exponentially in the last in the last 12 months and will continue to do so. Great. Um, is there a possibility of deploying RC drilling on either of the properties uh, and uh, what is the current cost per meter? Okay, um, so we have already used RC drilling to get through the uh, the gravels and conglomerates that overlie the, the Perseverance project. It's extremely difficult to, to diamond that. So we're doing RC uh, tips and diamond tails um, in those holes, and that's that's been used very successfully. We're not using RC in um, in Colombia so much, although we have done it previously for some of the uh, some of the hydro holes. Uh, was there another part of that question? Oh, it was um, the costs. Yeah. yeah, so costs, unfortunately, it's not cheap in, in either uh, jurisdiction right now. Um, so we're using major drilling at, at Perseverance. And so the cost, per they don't actually charge by the meter, they charge by the hour. Uh, so the cost per meter entirely depends on productivity. And I'd only be able to tell you the overall costs once we finish. So I won't be drawn on that. Uh, in Colombia, though, we've put out some competitive tenders uh, and we've got costs back which are acceptable. Uh, I'd love them to be cheaper, but in the current environment, it's um, it's very difficult to get there. Okay, great. Um, and then just on the exploration front at San Matias, it's a you know big property package there. Um, are you planning any other exploration kind of outside of that northern extension target or the the porphyry? Uh, looking for that porphyry at depth. Uh, yes, it's a simple answer, but we've not put anything into the market just yet, so I won't be too specific as to what we'll be doing and, and when, uh, but I would remind people that we're also exploring elsewhere in our package in Colombia, um, so we've got active explorations uh, for, to the, uh, for to the south in our uh, Crystallina project, for instance. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I think with that, we'll, we'll wrap up there and give people a couple minutes to transition to the next one. Uh, so thank you very much, Sarah and Mark, and everybody for joining us. Uh, up next, we have Silver Tiger Metals on Stream 1 and Canadian Palladium on Stream 2. Thanks for having us, Taylor. Thank you. Goodbye.